salli ala muhammadin wa ali muhammad Allahumma salli ala muhammadin wa ali muhammad Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa salatu wa salamu ala khair al-anbiya wal mursaleen Khatimin nabiyin bil qasim Muhammad Allahumma salli ala Wa ala ahli bayti al-tawhirin al-masumin Salawat Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad Wa kala Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Fil Quran al-majid Wa furqan al-hamid Wa qawlu al-haq بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم كنتم خير أمة أخرجت للناس تأمرون بالمعروف وتنحون عن المنكر وتؤمنون بالله صلوات اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد الله سبحانه وتعالى إن سورة آل إمران آية 110 Praises the Ummat of Holy, the Holy Prophet Muhammad Mustafa sallallahu alaihi wa alaihi wasallam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. And he praises them for this quality about them, that they believe in Allah subhanahu wa taala. But also, what makes them the best is that coupling of that belief in Allah subhanahu wa taala with the tendency and with this quality and this habit of always promoting goodness and forbidding evil subhanallah this is um, quite an eye opener it shows us that this is uh, what allah subhanahu wa ta'ala considers most praiseworthy in his believers that they do amr bil maruf and nahyan al munkar and subhanallah as we are learning about the lessons of life and death from the Nahjul Balagha, what better place for us to learn about how to do Amr Bil Maruf and Nahyan Al Munkar and how to believe in Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. This book of Imam Ali Alayhi Salam, his letters, his sermons, his sayings, uh, anecdotes from his life, all of them put together a formula for us and truly uh, a uh, uh, a list of uh, incredible prescriptions and recommendations to make our lives successful, both in the here and in the hereafter. Please recite Salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. The days of uh, Mahi Muharram are going very fast indeed, and we are already at our sixth day of Muharram. And today, um, as we commemorate the martyrdom of the son of Imam Hassan, that new prince, Shah Qasim alayhi salam, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad, we are struck with the amazing upbringing of the Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam when it came to bringing up the children and when it came to teaching them about what life is all about. The Aymai Tahirin alayhi salam have not only taught their children but they've also taught their companions and they've also taught others who were working with them to guide and to govern the Muslims. One of the um, beautiful letters in Nahjul Balagha and yesterday we looked at uh, the letter uh, 31 of Imam Ali alayhi salam to his children when he was giving them uh, and basically to us giving them all these um, what, what, what is called the will of Imam Ali alayhi salam, all these uh, wishes of Imam for his followers, what they should do, how they should think, 
how they should look and how reflect reflecting they should be about everything always thinking about life thinking about the people of uh, the one who ones who came and the ones who left and what did they leave behind and how to deal with others one of the most beautiful sayings that I find really touches my heart and that uh, from that particular letter and it's full of amazing sayings and uh, recommendations but one that really I find it really resonates with me is when Imam Ali alayhi salam tells his children that when you deal with others do not let them choose how the flavor of that conversation and the direction of that conversation will be do not let others insist on how that conversation will move forward because often we deal with people who want to argue with us or uh, who want to uh, hurt us or who want to uh, really press our buttons and to trigger us but imam ali alayhi salam is giving this idea and this uh, reality to us reminding us that you don't have to be triggered by others. You don't have to let them take you where they want to take you when it comes to talking or to have any interaction. And often something that starts very negatively with someone being very angry or uh, also being very um, judgmental or saying something that really hurts us and makes us just want to get angry and just rant. Doesn't have to be always that way. You can actually choose how you want that conversation to go and how that person should be talking to you and and how you want to talk to them you shouldn't be the one reacting you should be the one setting the tone allahumma salli ala muhammad wa ali muhammad what a beautiful way for us to um actually condition ourselves when we deal with people in our lives today as uh, that theme of dealing with others and lessons of life from Nahjul Balagha I want to focus on that very famous letter that Imam Ali alayhi salam wrote to his most beloved what, what, what we would call his right hand man and he has been described by Imam Ali alayhi salam as a very uh, trusted and a very dependable and a very pious human being who was, if he had lived uh, long enough, who, who was someone that Imam was really counting on when it came to governing, when he uh, took on the uh, caliphate um, as the fourth um, caliph in history. Of course, we know Imam Ali alayhi salam was always the, the first Imam, but in history, when he was finally given the governorship, uh, it was um, quite difficult because there were still many enemies. And this letter to Malik Ashtar, very well-known letter, is a letter that Imam Ali alayhi salam wrote to his most trusted advisor and governor uh, who, would, who would be eventually the governor of Egypt. And Imam Ali alayhi salam not only tells him how to lead, but he also tells him about how to lead with love and kindness and to deal with people from all walks of life. We as uh, the lovers of Imam Ali alayhi salam, we look at this letter not as uh, necessarily politicians because um, very few of us really get a chance to deal uh, with uh, community and be leaders or, or really take positions of political power. However, we all are very much leaders in our own right when we deal with family, when we deal with community, when we deal with anyone. We're all leaders and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us this role of being an ambassador of the faith and to also propagate the faith and to be living examples of the true leader, the true mu'min. So letter number 53, Malik Esther's letter, is actually quite a revealing letter in how one should look at everybody in their lives, especially when you are a little bit above them, whether it's in, above them in age, maybe above them in um, some kind of leadership role, but also sometimes in a relationship. Some people have kind of the upper hand. Um, it's basically about living with others. But here Imam Ali alayhi salam is giving this advice to a companion who would be ruling over a very, very strategic and a very important place uh, in the Islamic world. It's very interesting to know that Imam um, uh, Ali alayhi salam's uh, most trusted right hand man Malik Ashtar uh, was not only himself a very trusted companion but his sons also were great lovers of the Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam Malik Ashtar um, unfortunately was martyred on the way 
to Egypt. He never made it uh, there. The um, uh, Muavia had him uh, had him uh, martyred before he even got there. But um, he was praised even by the Holy Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam even before he had even come into uh, in, into the companionship of the um, um, of, of the of Imam Ali alayhi salam. In fact, uh, Abu Dhar, the trusted companion of Imam uh, of uh, Imam Ali alayhi salam and the companion of uh, the Holy Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He had been told by the Holy Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that, Oh, Abu Dhar, just as you are about to leave this world, your soul will be about to leave you. You can know that this is the last moment of your life. You will be visited by some true believers, some true mu'min. That's when you know that, the, that you are breathing your last, that you won't be in this world too much longer after that. And also that the people who come, when they introduce themselves, that the, that they are true believers, that I uh, see them as people who are on the Sirat al-Mustaqim and truly sincere followers of the Ahlul Bayt al-Muslim and of Islam. Malik Esther was that person that Abu Dhar, uh, the trusted companion, was visited by in the middle of the desert. And when he asked him who he was, when Malik Esther gave his name, Abu Dhar said that the Holy Prophet وسلم, had told me I would be visited by true mu'min just before I breathe my last. And that's exactly what happens, that he uh, um, passes away um, and they uh, they bury him. And uh, also, Malik Esther's two sons were very faithful companions of the Ahlul Bayt al uh, time doesn't permit me to really go into detail about how great a personality Ma uh, Malik Esther was and uh, uh, stories from his life and how uh, even when somebody had wronged him and treated him like a uh, like a common person that Malik Esther did not reveal that he was actually such a high level a governor, a leader of the Muslims and that when that person came to apologize when he found out he found Malik Esther in the in the Masjid al-Nabawi praying. And when the man apologized, Malik Esther said that I, in fact, am here on my prayer mat praying for your forgiveness because you didn't know uh, how what who I was and how you should have treated me as a fellow Muslim. So that's the kind of pious human being that he was. But he had these two incredible sons. One was Ishaq and the other was Ibrahim. Ishaq was a fun, phenomenal warrior. And he uh, actually supported Imam Hussein alayhi salam and, and was with him in Karbala. And uh, he gave his life for Islam. And it is said that after Habib ibn Mazahir, Ishaq uh, ibn Malik Yashtar, uh, was actually uh, one of, uh, uh, sent many of the enemies of Islam to, to hell. Uh, he um, was one of the most, the greatest fighters um, and sent many of the enemies to to, to the hellfire. As, uh, and then we look at Ibrahim ibn Malik Ashtar. He went on to actually accompany the, the well-known uh, companion, Mukhtar al thakafi And when Hazrat Mukhtar rose to take uh, revenge against the killers of Imam Hussein alayhi salam, uh, it was none other than this son of Malik Ashtar named Ibrahim, who was a key person who helped him and who was instrumental in finding those people and uh and 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 avenging them for for the for the tragedy of Karbala this letter to Maliki Ashtar is a very famous letter although it was written almost 1400 years ago but what's interesting is it's not just us Muslims but it's also the non-Muslims who have looked at this letter as a specimen on how to deal with people in the world, especially those who are lesser than us that we are supposed to be guiding. The letter has a lot of advice in it on how to deal with human beings, how to also look at the class system of people, uh, the haves and the have-nots, and also uh, dealing with one's army, dealing with one's trusted uh, advisors, uh, how to look at the, the people, uh, what the people want, what democracy means. It is a very political letter indeed to understand how the world works. But if you look um, into it deeply, you realize this is 
general advice for anybody. You don't have to be the king of any nation to have to list, look at this letter and find something out of it. The UN Secretariat, the um, uh, Committee of Human Rights in New York, uh, where the United Nations, under the chairmanship of the Secretary General, the former Secretary General, Kofi Annan. We know in, uh, famously in 2002, they had this historic, they had this resolution in United Nations. What was this resolution? That the Caliph Ali ibn Abi Talib is considered the fairest governor who appeared during human, human history after the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Salawat. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Shows you that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to give you um, um, status in this world, that even if the people try to kill you and hide you and deny you your actual role and your actual seat of power, that uh, the truth will prevail and your name will always ra rise above even if people deny it to you. So Imam Ali alayhi salam, it says in the resolution, is considered the fairest governor who appeared during human history. And the World Organization for Human Rights has called the rulers of the world to follow the example of this sound and human, uh, the sound and human humanitarian method in ruling um, that Imam uh, Ali alayhi salam has used. And this letter of Maliki Ashtar is the letter that has been used in the United Nations to send to all the, the, the people to teach them about how to be a true leader. And the UNDP in um, 2002 in Arab Human Development Report, it gave at least six things of Imam Ali alayhi salam about ideal governance. And it's because this letter has, you know, about consultation between the ruler and the ruled. It has ideas about speaking up against corruption, against wrongdoings, doing Amr al maruf and Nahyan al-Munkar, ensuring justice to all, achieving domestic development to ensure that your people are happy and that what they say about you matters. Uh, it is said that this letter to Maliki Ashtar has the most number of sayings of Imam Ali alayhi salam. Every sentence, every sentence has something incredible uh, that can give us so much advice on how to lead our lives. The letter number 31 that we looked at yesterday, the, 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 the will of Imam Ali alayhi salam is also like that. Every sentence, every sentence is worth looking at deeply and just saying, wow, so much wisdom in these letters. So Imam Ali alayhi salam, um, one of the things and is in a summary and then I'll try to go a bit deeper into it in the time that we have yeah Imam Ali alayhi salam tells Malika Ashtar and this is for all of us that even if you are a leader you're just a servant of God and one of the themes in this letter is that you know when you're powerful in anything in life whether it's in our family whether it's in our work whether it's in the world with our money and our status that you are still a servant of God don't forget that you you may be a leader but never consider yourself a god that you can make people's lives and a kingmaker and a change or changer of destiny. Humility has to always be in a human being, uh, and it's very important for a leader to be a, a pious person who is um, who does sajda, because sajda, when you put your head on the ground, is supposed to make you humble, to make make you realize I'm nothing, I am close to this ground. You know, a lot of people who are not used to sitting on the floor find it very difficult, if you've noticed. Um, they don't even know how to position themselves. Uh, even sajda is something that requires the whole body. That's why a lot of people who even try to do yoga, it's very difficult in the beginning to make the body uh, be so close to the ground and then to uh, make it completely rest on the ground and to, to become very close to it. Uh, sajda is like that. And makes a person become very humble. And that is the symbolic feeling it's supposed to give a person. That I'm nothing. I'm putting the most important part of my body, my head, on the ground. And mixing my face with dust. Rubbing my nose in the dust. I am nothing. And I could be the king of kings, but I bow to my God. I bow, I bow, I bow to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Lord of the worlds. Maliki yawmiddin. So uh, Imam Ali alayhi salam tells uh, Malik Ashtar in this letter that don't give people the cause, uh, don't give people cause to envy each other. When you are dealing with family members, when you're dealing with people in, in your circle, try not to do something so that one becomes jealous of the other. And this is about causing that balance in the society. 
there shouldn't be a have and have not so that one looks down on the other and one looks up at the other thinking if only and this also talks about the caste system and how you know uh, we look down on people who are of certain class or a certain color or breed or tribe um and and imam is cautioning against that he says don't put man against man tribe against tribe one section of the society against the other showing us that islam is a religion of peace but we're not supposed to be aligning with certain people and getting against certain people and then causing these fights and wars um, or being these very sly people who make friends with one person and then incite them to make, you know, do all this politics to make people fight with each other. He says that the best way to achieve this, um, you know, not causing people to envy one, one another is to not be hasty in making remarks. Don't speak too fast. And delay, what a beautiful thing, delay in delivering punishments. Um, don't be to, so quick to, you know, you know those old leaders of the past, off with his head, take this off, do this, and, you know, fire this person. Keep your temper. Don't get overexcited. When we, uh, when we think before we speak, even when it is about children who have um, disobeyed um, or, or done something really bad, um, take time to think it over. There's no need to immediately punish. It can, it can. You can think about it for a day or two even, and you can tell the person I'm thinking about how I'm going to be dealing with this. But when you're hasty in judgment and in punishment, you can cause a, a bigger rebellion. And this is not only in the community, but it is also in people that we are dealing with. Imam also says in this letter that to remain humble and to not be hasty and to not just speak whatever comes to the mouth and to judge people and to think you're God can only happen, this will only not happen if you're constantly doing a dhikr Allah and that you're remembering that you have to return to God and that, um, you know, that fear, that khafi ilahi, that, that knowing that I have to go back to my God, how will I answer for being so unmerciful and oppressive to people who had nowhere to run? Um, even in homes that, God forbid, where uh, women are being uh, abused or children are being abused, think about it, that how much they will have to answer to Allah, those people who oppress those uh, uh, you know, poor, um, uh, defenseless women and children who are, who are beaten and who are verbally abused and emotionally abused, physically abused. When a person has nowhere to run and you are the one in charge and you use your power to make them feel bad and worse and to and to punish them then um misuse of power there will be a lot to answer to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala imam says never say to yourself i am their lord i'm their leader and that i'm i must be obeyed submissively and, and imam says imam says if you think this way it'll unbalance your mind it'll make you vain and arrogant It'll make you weaken in your faith in religion. It'll make you seek any support of power other than that of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You will start to think you're great and that you're the one making things happen. Imam says, select honest, truthful, and pious people as your companions. The people who are beside you. A man is known by the company he keeps, but he also makes decisions based on the people that he surrounds himself with. So a leader should be and any person should be very careful who they have around them. Toxic people, negative people, people who are bitter, suspicious, who are always thinking the worst of people, who are stingy, who are greedy, who are cowardly. All these people can have an effect on how we make decisions in our lives. So Imam says, I order you to use your head, your heart, your hands, and your tongue to help the creatures of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's a holistic thing, uh, understanding that we're not here for ourselves, we're here to serve, we're all Abdullah. And Imam says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will hold, will, uh, has, um, has promised that he will help those who sincerely try their best to help God. So God helps us when we are giving and taking care of the oppressed and the and the unfortunate and he says let the dearest of your treasures malik when you have so much wealth let the dearest of your treasures be righteous action it's doing good things which are filled with taqwa that should be your most important possession and when people make us 
do something or say, let's go here or, you know, let's lie or that's all right. That's for once. It's okay to do this and drink a little or do this or do that or, you know, loosen the hijab. Why are you wearing this? You know, do this for once or it's okay. These kinds of things are actually um, us selling our akhirat away. We're giving it away for a few moments of pleasing somebody or giving into our carnal desires. And it should be our wealth, this these righteous actions that we're doing, our iman. And that's why we often say the hibzu aman, we want to stay protected. Our iman should be kept in uh, in protection. This iman is all that we have and the, the, the righteous actions that we have. Nobody should take that away from us or it should not ever become threatened um, by the luring of shaitan he says infuse your heart your heart should be filled with mercy with love with kindness for people around you for your subjects and be not uh in the face of uh, people who are looking up to you as a leader don't be in in front of them like a voracious animal looking at them as their prey as their victims and there are such leaders who um whether it's in the community, whether it's in the work face, uh, workplace, they're so cruel that people are afraid of them. They literally shake when they come. They say they're going to be very rude. They're going to take us to attack. They're going to yell at us in front of everybody. And then this very famous um, sentence that we uh, we will always hear about Imam Ali Ali saying that, remember, that there are two kinds of people. That people are either your brothers in religion or they're your equal in creation. So a person can be a brother uh, of Islam, in Islam, uh, or it can just be someone who, was, who is a creation of God, still deserves respect, still deserves that kind of brotherly feeling. And uh, Imam, um, the Holy Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, has talked about this, that you know, when you are with the people, deal with them in a good way, and look around you in society, um, seeing things in th that that should make you feel like hey i want to do something about this whoever amongst you sees an evil he must change it with his hand the holy prophet wasallam says and if he's unable to do so then he has to do it with his tongue and if he's unable to do so then with his heart and but he says that's the weakest form of faith just saying oh i wish things could be better uh, the ihsas has to be there, the feeling has to be there that this is wrong, that there are people starving or that there are people being oppressed, that the, the government is acting this way against these people. But it's not my problem, so I'll stay out of it. I should protect myself. No, we do need to speak up. We do need to make the world a better place. And that is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is praising us, knowing that this is not easy. What Imam Hussain alayhi salam did uh, in going to Karbala required a lot of courage, required a lot of thirst, a lot of effort, a lot of uh, shedding of blood, a lot of um, fighting for what is right. So it's not easy to get these great victories, but absolutely, when we do get them, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ensure that we get paid for that uh, forever and ever. And Allah praises that kuntum khayra ummatin ukhrajat linnasi ta'amaruna bil ma'arufi wa tanhawna anil munkari wa tu'minuna billah. So these are the people, the best of my mankind, who um, promote goodness, who uh, prohibit evil, and they believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imam Ali alayhi salam says that one who um, refrains from doing this, you know, sits back and just sees people doing bad things. Uh, there's a lot of, you know, gibat going on, backbiting, hurting, uh, plotting, planning. Absolutely, we need to stay away from such people, but... Just distinct, distancing ourselves and not making an effort to be part of the solution uh, makes us part of the problem, makes us part of the crime. So Imam Ali alayhi salam says, one who refrains from prohib prohibiting the evil by means of his heart, his hand, and his tongue. It's like he's a dead amongst the living. So what good is this life? What good is this power if we don't use it to raise our voice for the underprivileged and for those who are um, um, who are who need us? You know, there's a very beautiful um, 
um, simile that the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam um, used to explain this. He says that the likeness of a man who, who thinks that, you know, uh, I, uh, I'm not going to do anything. I'll just be quiet. Uh, what I do doesn't affect them. What they do doesn't affect me. He says it's like a person who's on a, on a ship and they are leveled. Some people are in the lower deck. Some people are in the higher deck. They're all in the same boat. Now, what do they do? They see that the people at the bottom of the ship are making a hole. The people at the bottom are saying, hey, if we make a hole here, it's not going to affect, affect you. We're the ones, if the water falls on us, it's our problem. And so they watch the people on the upper deck are seeing them. And not stopping them, thinking, well, yeah, the hole is in their part of the ship. Not realizing that when they, when the ship goes down, it's because we're all in the same ship. And if one damage happens to that ship, it affects the whole ship. Everyone drowns. And that famous saying of the Holy Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that the Ummah is like a body. And if one part of the body hurts, then the whole body should feel the pain. But if we think it's not, you know, it's too bad that they suffer, the Muslims or the non-Muslims, or anyone is suffering any kind of injustice and we don't raise our voice, what we're doing is being like these people who are watching someone drill a hole at the bottom of the boat and thinking it's not going to affect us. These things affect society. It changes the flavor of the society. It changes families. It changes human beings. Um, it changes history. And, uh, the, and the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says that uh, if they, the occupants of the upper deck, leave these people to carry out whatever they are doing about drilling the hole, then all will be drowned. But if they do not let them go ahead, if they do that, uh, Amr bil Maruf and Nahyan al Munkar, what happens? All of them remain safe. Even though sometimes you're trying to save people who don't want to be saved, they say, Leave me alone. I have, it's my life. I can do whatever I want. But when you see what is right, you have to speak up. Um, when we look at the surah uh, uh, Wal Asr, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about everyone being a, uh, a person who loses out terribly. But who doesn't lose out? These are the people who have that faith. They're doing everything right. They're believing in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They're doing good deeds. But, amanu, they have good, they're doing good amal. They're doing having good faith and iman. They're not just doing, staying on haq themselves. They're uh, reminding people to be on haq. They're encouraging people to be haq, on haq. And they're not the only ones doing sabr. They are. In encouraging others to do sabr. So this type of feeling means that there's a social consciousness. There's a feeling of being connected uh, connected with the world. Uh, Islam doesn't allow us to live on an island all by ourselves and just mind our own business and say, we're doing Allah, Allah, we're good. Um, no, it means you have to mix with the people and still be pious and make a difference in people's lives. And the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam send a salawat he says that who, he who leads others to piety will be rewarded the same as the doer of the good action. Encouraging people to do good things, reminding them when they do it, there is a thawab jariya. The person who has taught us to do a good deed uh, gets the thawab indeed. They get a dividend. Um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ensures everyone uh, gets... Um, uh, gets a piece of that pie everyone who's part of a good thing will get their due and that is why the holy prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam had always so told the people that help each other in good works help you help each other in doing things that uh, will change lives will um when you see a good a good a good thing happening go and lend a helping hand Inshallah, uh, tomorrow we will continue to talk more about this famous letter to Malik Ashtar because there are deep, deep things to be gained from it and a, a great amount of treasures. Um, a reminder that Malik Ashtar gets from Imam Ali Alayhi Salam 
that O oh, Malik understand that I'm sending you as a governor to a country which in the past has experienced both just and unjust rule which means that when you're dealing with people remember they are suffering they've suffered as well they've had good days but they've had difficult days as well deal with people in a gentle sweet way you don't know what someone is going through so easy to um just think everybody looks fine they're looking happy they're coming with us they're mixing with us it's later on that we find out they were they were dealing with great illness in their family or lack of money or a death or a betrayal or abuse so look at people as hurt people as injured people imam also says that remember when people are watching you their eyes are on you that they will do that they you used to when you were an, the underdog the person who was not in a place of leadership you used to scrutinize the favors of those before you didn't you and you spoke of people as well right we judge people we say hey these people in in leadership they don't do this they don't do that well when you are in charge and now they're going to speak about you the same way that you spoke about them um also this is a uh, a good reminder that let's not criticize people in power because first of all we don't know what they're going through and what the difficulties are but also uh it's easy to speak about them um but when our time comes god forbid they will have they'll speak the same way um it what goes around does come around um and an interesting thing that imam says look at what people say about you now a lot of people say we don't care what what people say well, who are these people I don't care what they say. I'll do what I want. Unfortunately, this is mostly when we're doing something that's un-Islamic. When we're doing a good thing, um we we hardly the ones saying I don't care what people will think. Uh it, it it's mostly when we want to do something very rebellious, uh, you know, and something like uh that people say that's not a good thing to do. And people will speak about you and say I don't care what people say about me. Um Imam says in this letter that the fact is that pe- the public speaks well of those only those who do good things this is the world do good things good things will be said about you be careful of the reputation that you create of yourself that you sometimes god forbid inadvertently um put of yourself out there you can't blame people to uh, for saying bad things about you if you've always acted terribly in public if you have dealt uh in a terrible way with someone if you've cheated people if you've in the past yelled at people swore at them uh hit somebody that's the reputation we create and if we are not what people say then we should be acting consistently in such a way that only good things can be said about us i mean imam ali alayhi salam had so many enemies but they couldn't speak much evil about him they had to concede he was a good human being because they he he didn't leave anything negative for them to be able to say about him so uh, truly a lot of good uh, pieces of advice in this letter and inshallah tomorrow uh, we will um, look deeper into this uh, if allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us an opportunity there's wealth of knowledge and advice in imam ali alayhi salam's um uh, teachings and in in what he has left for us uh, as a legacy Please recite salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala. Today when we remember that son of Imam Hasan alayhi salam brought up with much love left behind as a support for his mother. But what a beautiful son that when he keeps coming to Imam Hussein alayhi salam asking him for permission to go out into the battlefield. Imam Hussein alayhi salam looks at Hasan and says, "Hasan, you don't understand. How can I let you go? In your face I see the face of my brother Hasan. My brother Hasan and I were so close to each other. He was my best friend, he was my companion, and I want to leave this world with a memory of Hasan at least in in this world that we will be all gone but at least you will remain hasan uh, the the son of hasan and said qasim goes to his father, his mother and he puts his head on her lap and he is very sad he is crying bibi umfarwa says oh qasim 
What is wrong? Why are you so sad? He says, Mother, I realized today that if my father had been alive, that I would have had someone who could speak for me. Today, when we look at the story of Qasim, we realize that there are many orphans in this world who look around and they look at people who speak for them, who protect them, who provide for them, who give them love and shelter, and they look around and feel so alone. We cannot let the orphans of this world feel alone and forgotten and neglected because they do think this way. They say, has the world forgotten us? Do they not know that we're hungry? If we had a father, he would have taken us out. That feeling that comes in an orphan that if my father was alive today, no one would speak to me so cruelly. No one would treat me unkindly. My protector is not here. Hazrat Qasim cries and he says to his mother, Oh mother, if my father was here alive today, I know that he himself would have allowed me to go to the battlefield. All the other children, all the other young men, their parents are there, their fathers are there to speak on their behalf. He says, oh mother, can you not speak to my uncle? But baby Omar Farwa says, how can I speak to Imam Hussain? How do I speak in front of him, my child? Both mother and son shed many tears. Whenever Imam Hussain sees Qasim, he knows that Qasim is very sad, but he says he does not know that I need him alive for his mother. His mother needs him. When Qasim at night of Ashura hears all the mothers preparing their children for the battlefield, he's sad. He says, I will not give this, get this opportunity. I do not get to make you proud of me, oh my dear mother. The day of Ashura, as all the companions one by one are martyred, all of Muhammad also are martyred. That is when Shah Qasim cries. He says, Oh, my mother, what have I done wrong? That all of Muhammad get to go and give their life for Mullah Hussein, but I cannot do so. So, that time. Bibi, oh my says, this is truly a time of great musiba for us, oh my dear son. At that time she remembers that Imam Hassan had told her, when there is great calamity in your life, oh my farwa, there is this letter that I will leave for you. Open this only when life is giving you the most difficult moment. And Bibi, oh my farwa, opens it and she takes it to her son. She says, this is a letter. And it's written for Imam Hussein. Go give this, oh my son, to your uncle. Perhaps it will have what you need in it. When Imam Hussein opens that letter and he sees the words of written by his own brother Hussain, he cries, he sheds tears. He says, oh my brother, today in Karbala, and I feel so alone when there is no Habib, when there is no Ona Muhammad, no Muslim Ibn Asaja. Everybody is gone. And now members of the family are going one by one. I have felt the emptiness, seeing your handwritten words, smelling the, your scent in this paper makes me feel like you are with me, oh Hassan. In the letter, Hassan writes, Oh, my brother Hussein, if I was there in Karbala, I myself would have gone in the battlefield. I would not let you go. But I leave my son Qasim for you. Send him to the battlefield. And it is as if I was there. And so Shah Qasim is so happy as his mother dresses him up. She puts the amama of his father on him. She dresses him up in the clothes that he wore when he was alive. And he was a prince, Imam Hassan, the beautiful one. And as Qasim was put on the horse, a young boy whose feet, they say, could not even reach the stirrups because he was still a young man who was just blossoming. They call him Qasim and Osha. Qasim the new prince, the Nosha. And as he is led out 
into the battlefield. The people say it is like a groom is on a horse. His mother has dressed him up as if he is getting married. And he goes into the battlefield. The enemies see him and they say, What mother had the heart to send such a beautiful son? And the enemy, one by one, as they attack Qasim, he fights valiantly, for he was taught by none other than Hazrat Abbas. And Qasim fights them one upon one, one by one. The enemy realized that they cannot, they cannot win and that's why they surround him from all sides Qasim calls out oh my uncle they have surrounded me oh my uncle they are attacking me from all sides a child who was not used to the people who are so evil that they do not ful fulfill the rules of the battle Imam Hussein and Hazrat Abbas in a, in a, a panic state and feeling anxious about their dear nephew come out into the battlefield on their horses the en enemies go helter skelter the ones on the left go to the right the one on the right go to the left in all this confusion Qasim falls from his horse and his foot is caught in that stirrup that he was barely getting into and at that time he calls out oh my mom oh my uncle help me at that time the enemy attacks Qasim and the horses trample him and he is alive he is alive when the horses trample him and that is why Imam Hussein had asked him oh Qasim oh Qasim you know you will give your life up Qasim what do you think of death when you think of martyrdom Qasim had said it feels sweeter to me than honey because Imam knew, oh Qasim, you will taste death. You will be alive when the horses trample you and your body will be crushed. Imam takes his Abaha. He puts pieces of the body of Qasim on it. He makes a bundle of the body parts. He puts it on his back. He says, Allah, 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 Oh, Zainab! Oh, my cousin! Oh, my farwa! Look, I bring the pieces of Hassan, my brother! Allah, 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 come as all I mean. Matame Hussein. Matame Hussein. Hussein.